traffic, street lights, whatever other pollution there may be along that road. They're exercising their rights. And it seems that to, to say that, to put the burden on them, is not just erroneous, but arrogant. And I think that maybe you should consider that this burden is on you. If you, if you choose to take the project forward, that's fine. In, in, in fact, disapprove, but it's not on the property owner's shoulders for trying to protect what is legally, what was legally theirs. Um, I thank you for your time, and I encourage you to, to oppose the funding for this project, and then take every action you can to, to step back, to back up, and correct the errors you have made. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Stein yet? Seeing okay. none? You're good. I didn't, didn't see any questions. <laughs> Um, anyone else from the public wish to speak on this item? Yeah. Come forward, please. <coughs> My name is Michelle Honk, and I live at 1210 East Ridge. And I'll be very short. I just wanted to um, put another perspective on the cost of the road by quantifying a few things. Um, I, if you think of the, uh, Linda was describing this too as, and I don't know how else to say it except for, um, th if these two roads are the new road that's coming and the existing East Ridge, and then I'm thinking of Hillcrest, that little piece of Hillcrest across is the top of this rectangle, little piece of Bader is the bottom of this rectangle. I just went out and drove it, and, and I drove what I think was probably too long of a section up top but that took me 31 seconds to get across from where the road would be to where East Ridge currently is now. Then I drove down at the bottom and that took me 26 seconds to get from where East Ridge is on Vader over to where the new road would be. I'm guessing the speed limit would be comparable. Would it be 25 miles per hour just as it is down East Ridge? So any time spent in this direction is not additional time. If you think of it that way, you are spending $800,000 to save drivers uh, 57 seconds of drive time. And if you um, put that into dollars per second, sorry, I opened it up on my phone, it turns out to be $14,000.35 per second. That's the cost that this road would be. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wish to comment on this item? Item two, or administrative, administrative item. Can you say your name and address, please? Julie McMeekin, 1888 Carroll K Boulevard. And the reason why I'm opposed to this is I really think it is a road to nowhere. And all it's going to do on Carroll K is cause a bunch of speeding traffic. They already have a lot of speeders on that road now. Oh, I do want to say I appreciate the extra lights down at the ball field because now we don't have any whatever drug traffic thing or human traffic things going down there is not happening anymore. Just so you know, there was stuff going on down there several nights a week. Now there's not, so I do appreciate that. Um, but I do feel that this is a big mistake. I didn't weigh in on a work company before because I didn't realize all that was going on. But if, but if somebody tried to take the land, then I guess I'd be very upset. We already have the Department of Transportation taking a little bit of our land over by Osceola, Nebraska to build a four-lane highway that's going to go basically nowhere for several years. They've been planning that for 50 years. There isn't enough traffic on that road to warrant a four-lane highway past our point. And I don't think I really want extra traffic on Carroll K. We already do with a lot of traffic during the baseball season, during the soccer season, you know, when they have sporting events down there. During the eight o'clock morning rush in the morning and then the end of school rush, there's a ton of traffic on that road already. And we'd like to not have as much traffic as we do. It's really not gonna help. Where you need to put the money is on Waverly Road by the school to improve that traffic flow there and to have a decent road. That road's really terrible. So anyway, I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on item two? Why does 756 North 4th Street? Um, obviously, I'm not a homeowner. I'm there, so I have no claim to whether or not it's going to fix problems or not. 
Um, I'm here as a taxpayer who owns property and my money is going towards this project as well. Um, and I'm a big person on process because process is what judges, lawyers use because what happens, a process protects citizens and it protects government agencies, it protects everyone, right? You follow the process and everyone can do it. Um, I have a few questions if you can clarify for me the $124,000 that was written you had mentioned that it came from a fund. We had $100,000 from a fund that we had to use towards a road project. Where did that come from? And then if we don't, under my initial assumption was that, that I had was that that was a prepayment. So is that all money that is going towards the engineering costs or is that simply sitting in the fund waiting to be used for the actual construction of the road? And, and if we don't, where does that money go? The first thing I'm going to do, because if we read our agenda and the state, yeah, it's to the determination of the mayor who answers questions by any of us. So I'll defer to the mayor first whether I even need to answer questions at this point. And then go do you have the numbers on the, as far as the? It's not a specific number. She's just asking what those funds are. If you, if you can answer it. I can. Okay. Just making sure there's a process and we read that at every single meeting for a reason. So, um, the, the dollars that uh, Aaron's referring to are the STP dollars that we talked about both during throughout this process this year and then also in your budget, I believe, in 2018. Um, the city had STP dollars that had been held over since, I believe, maybe 2016. And they were sitting idle, and we were given notification, much like the CDBG dollars we're talking about today, that said, you need to ensure that these funds go out Otherwise, they'll need to be returned to the state, or you'll be limited on your STB dollars in the future because you're not moving your STB dollars out. So as we talked about in the budget process clear back in 2018, um, we continued to list these projects in your capital improvement list every single year, both Waverly Road, Carroll K, and the Trail. And as we all are well aware in this town, not one of those projects from 2016 on has been built yet. And so listing a million dollar project in our CIP that we don't ultimately build continues to take in state dollars that then aren't ultimately used in the budget process. And so we were continually getting behind. And so to catch back up, I said, we need to ensure these dollars go out. They go to a qualifying street project. And I said, the one that we have available right now that we have the definitive number we're at a minimum required to was the Carroll K project. I think at that time it was 169000 was our initial 20% pursuant to the contract, approximately. Okay. So and the three different payments, there's three different payments yep. that we made. So, 124 so, and so the 124 and then the two others uh, that are in there, the 124 is a prepayment on our initial 20%. Again, as we've talked about before, we've currently incurred, and, and Jody can probably speak to some of this, we currently have approximately incurred about $300,000 with the state. If the project doesn't move forward, we do not approve the bid, or we would terminate the project, we would be responsible for the total sum of 300000 which we've already paid in 124 in our prepayment with STP, and then additional dollars that we've paid out uh, from requests by ADFT. So those are STP dollars. Those are approved to be moved by this body pursuant to, I think, the 2018 budget process. It was to get those dollars out so we didn't jeopardize dollars in the future. We had to stop listing projects that we were not completing within the year because it set off the budget um, formula that they have in there, showing all these projects you never, year in, year out, we're not doing. That's your that's right. yep. um, and so that brings me to, I think, what we're talking about is why wasn't this project done as deemed a shovel-ready project? Um, you know, I question... I guess I question a few things about, you know, accepting a bid when it appears through this process, like council members don't know all of the information up front, right? Um, either we're not reading materials, we're, um, you know, saying in, in other forums that, um, you know, this is what the project addresses, um, it addresses one thing, and when it actually was said then a week and a half later to actually address those things that were said that it didn't address, um, so I'm looking at this from a money standpoint, and I'm looking at 68,000 initial for um, engineering costs. 
And I'm wondering why throughout this process, since, since the whole argument for the council accepting this project is that the costs keep going up and we're incurring all these costs and we have to be fiscally responsible. What about a $68,000 initial engineering contract going up to $208,000 when they knew, after being re-engineered, when they knew that those lands were wetlands, they knew the parkland, they knew the floodplain, they had the right-of-way acquisition deemed for this project at $49,000 in 2009. So why is no one questioning the fact that these costs have gone up? And I don't know if you want to, but we've contacted people. I've talked to Chris Newman at um, um, the Stewardship and Oversight Committee at the Federal Highway. Um, and I've been directed to Mary, and I talked to Mary today. Um, because I want to know those answers. I want to know why, if our argument is we've spent so much money on this, and we're trying to be fiscally responsible, why we're not questioning the fact that we have paid over $160,000 extra on engineering fees for a road that was shovel ready in 2009. So that's my question as to why we're pushing for a bid to cover these. We don't know the cap costs, we don't know how much it's going to incur, and we're expecting it has very little, you know, there are people who want it, and I get that, Nothing is ever going to be 100%. But, you know, you have all of these objections to it. You're looking at the process for eminent domain, and I don't know how many of you have studied eminent domain. Um, I've spent more time on the phone with lawyers, um, Bill Blake and such, in Lincoln, and talked to him about the eminent domain process because it, of course, was blamed on the homeowners that they were raising costs. And I asked him, I said, tell me about the process because I have the process that they went through, that the state negotiated with them. And he talked about good faith measures, he talked about the meetings that they should have, he talked about the time frame, and um, in a phone call that Linda had with um, Tom Weber's associate, um, she said that the state just assumed through these random phone calls that you didn't want to negotiate. And I told Bill Blake that, and he said, you can't do that. And I said, I know. So my question, and, and I think really what I'm trying to get at is you're pushing through a project that has abused citizens that you represent. Um, you haven't asked questions as to why the costs have gone up. I haven't heard you asking those questions. And you're pushing something through that really the, the process itself is very questionable. And you're also pushing something through where numerous ones of you sitting on the council right now have said you wouldn't have voted for it if it was up to you. But now you're stuck with it. And I think that's a cop-out. Um, I think that's irresponsible. Yes. Aaron, you need to tell us you're a candidate for state council here. This is becoming this honest. I am, because of this. All right, but you need, Because you need of to this, tell Ellen, I have seen the process that you guys have gone through, and stop, I don't stop, need to do stop. that. All I ask is you, that you declare that, because this is becoming more of a campaign speech than it is an objection to I this do not think process. that is fair whatsoever. You are putting some words into my mouth, and I will be here. If you'd like, I'll withdraw my city council candidacy, and I will still fight this right now. You so that is not fair for you to do that, and I have every right to stand up here you as a citizen, you should Ellen, and I will Ellen, absolutely withdraw that. Hold on. Ellen, you want to say we, I think we have a five-minute limit. If you could wrap up. Yep, your comments, absolutely. Please. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll go with that. If I were on the city council, I would have asked those questions. I wouldn't be skirting it off that it's someone else's responsibility who voted for this, and I wouldn't be doing that. Because it's not the right process, it's not how you should operate, and apparently there are city council members who do think that. And you're one of them who said that you wouldn't have voted for the project, but now you have to. So how do you answer that? I never said I had to. It's in an email. It's it's not not a Aaron, the answer is not a question answering. Okay. Are you, are well, you finished? Yeah. Okay, thank yep. you. Are there um, any questions for Aaron? Yeah. Seeing none, thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Anyone else from the public wish to comment on this item? No, um, we can't. We can't go back over this once you've talked. You've talked. Anyone else want to add? Anything? It's a clarification. It's not. A, what's it's your a, What's your question? The clarification is something that that Greg mentioned about a letter that Concordia sent in regard to the audit. What, what's your question? I'm going um, to just clarify that um, he made it sound like Concordia was 
whatever, I don't think any Concordia needs to be going into this, the clarification was made to Concordia about that word. We said obstructed and the, the record from the city used the word did not endorse. Now, Greg just read the actual letter, so well, no, I have understanding to, that was their word. This, this is in the city minutes from February 2013 and July 2013, and the city said that Concordia told them, I have the record, told them that they did not endorse the project. The misrepresentation was when the audit thing we sent in, we said Concordia objected. We talked to Concordia, that was cleared up. Concordia has no position, either for or against. I think that's but I just want to say that it, the minutes themselves said that, that they did endorse Concordia. Concordia was not aware of those minutes. And so when I, I shared those with them, and um, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. It kind of sounded more devious and, and scary than it really was. And it was a matter yeah. of terminology. Okay, well, I, I think Greg just read the letter, so whatever was in the letter. I'm talking was there about statement. what was said in the city minutes. Okay, well, uh, anyone from the public wish to comment on this item? Otherwise, we will close the public comment portion of the public. Did you want to speak? Okay. You state your name and address, please. Yep, Andy Sternbeck, 1106 Eastridge. Um, I think I wrote everybody on the council letter, so something like that, including the mayor. Uh, I'm new to the city, I've only been here six months, but basically I'll just state again what I stated in that email, which is, uh, would you spend the money if it was not being given to us by someone else? And I think that's a good question to ask uh, as you approve the bid. Uh, principle and logic are the issues for me with the building of the road, as already been kind of mentioned. Why wouldn't Waverly be addressed first? Why would you want to divert more traffic onto uh, Hillcrest, and then also, it strikes me as somewhat ironic that uh, America's Fourth of July city would let big government sort of push a project forward for um, a local government entity. So, that's all. Any questions? Say no, thank you. Anyone else from the public? We should speak. If not, then I will close the public comment portion of this item um, to uh, Greg. Did you want? Private transportation to yeah. come up. Would you, you guys like to come up? <laughs> You've been so patiently. Welcome to the podium. Please state your name. We don't need your address. I assume you don't live here. <laughs> no. okay. um, Jody Gibson, the Brass Department of Transportation and Local Assistance Division. Brendan Schmidt, right away division administrator for the Department of Transportation. Welcome. Did you have anything that you wanted to add? Or well, I guess did? maybe if there's any specific questions that you have for us. I mean, there's all probably a lot of things we could say, but is there anything specific that we can help you work through? Chris, you want to ask, ask I, something? I, I think the homeowners need to hear uh, an explanation of the delay in a shovel-ready project and the process there. I mean, typically most projects, the city manages, you guys manage this project for us because of the federal involvement. We, we turn that over to you. And uh, I, I think everyone is uh, interested in the, the timeline and the process. If, you guys can provide that and why it has taken the amount of time it has taken to, to, to get to where we're at today. Well, I can start a little bit. Like I said, there's a lot of history that I'm not also aware of, but um, when you say shovel ready, this project was originally programmed as a URB, which was when you guys used to get old STP funds, um, federal funds, and you guys would apply for a project through us to get some financial support for a project that you had a purpose for. Um, and then to make a long story short, we moved through and, and started buying out all the federal funds that went to the locals and um, municipalities and the, and the counties. There were some of those projects that were already in the queue that we agreed to continue um, to develop using STP funds and federal funds. This was one of them. So the shovel ready part of it, I am not exactly, I, I, I don't know if it really hit into Obama shovel ready kind of projects. I, I could check into that for you. I'm not that familiar with it. Um, but again, there is a process that, that we have to go through when we use any federal funds um, that, to develop a project. So, you know, sometimes those projects can take 
10 years to develop a project. Um, you know, that's just how it is. It, you know, we're trying to get better about delivering those projects in, in an expedited way. But again, we're doing things as a department to move them along. So um, I can't really specifically talk about why it took so long. There are certain phases that we just go through. Some redesign work was part of it. Um, but, you know, I'm not familiar with all of the history within the last, I know the last four years of the project. That's it. Is um, I think the well, just to address Chris part of what you said is I, John and I here are the two council members that have been on the council from way back. Well, I was 06, You were before that. And I do recall. I think it was either 2009 or 11 when when the stimulus dollars went out in our discussions. And there's probably something on on one of the minute records that there was some language tossed out that 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 the, the, the state or federal, we're looking for shovel-ready products, projects to, to utilize some of these funds. And this was one that was kind of said, hey, you know, this one would qualify. I think is where that, you know, whether it was ever yeah. as par part of the actual ask or anything, I'm not sure. And I don't know where, where we were in that process of shovel-ready. Sure. I don't know, I mean, for shovel-ready, it's you have a complete design and, and the environmental document approved. I don't know at the time if that, if no, that was I, the case. I think the requirement was it had to be like in your one and six year plan as something that you were looking to do. And and we've never used the term shovel ready here. That was a federal um, tagline, if you want, for, for why they were doing the stimulus. Mm -hmm. When we look at those types of, those opportunities don't come around very often from the federal government on, on a specific stimulus package like that. And so I think what, now 09 he predates me. But 11, or not 11, 11, I would have I've been here. And so I, I know part of that discussion was just that it was one of the projects on, on our one and six year plan that otherwise didn't qualify for other funding sources because it wasn't the main arterial, you know, it, it like, like Hillcrest or Pinewood or some of the major roads. And so the opportunity for funding for a project like that, I think it would be more scarce. Is that, I know we've changed it since then, does that sound? Does that sound familiar at all? That was, my, I guess, that was my impression at the time. Because again, I came into it after I think we already applied for it. Yeah, I, I mean, this specific project, I, I really, I'll be honest with you, I don't have the history of what happened back, you okay. know, during, those, that, during that time. The other question I had, besides addressing that, was as far as engineering costs, um, it was brought up that the initial um, request and, and uh, numbers were thrown out like $68,000. Is it, and I don't know any, anything about engineering a road like this, I know it's only like a quarter mile long, is the amount of, of increase in engineering that we've seen on this when there hasn't even been a tractor on the site yet, is this fairly typical or what, what how'd that happen, I guess, I think, is what I'm asking. I think Greg might be able to clarify that because we've not, that 68,000 number is not coming from us. Greg, you want to clarify that? That's one of the first ones, because that's been thrown around tonight by nearly everyone that's spoken. And so it just bothers me that we continue to Did it throw come up. from that original application that Mel filled out? No. That's where they're getting the number from. The problem is they're not even reading the document correctly. Mm -hmm. That's the first. Right. So if you look at, and this, was in, this document's included in their audit request, which is, again, where they start citing and everyone keeps repeating. Um, I just had it in my hands because I was doing the math. And I got thrown off because it got set again. Essentially, what you have to add together there, and I'm probably just put it down in the middle of all this mess. There it is, found it. Sorry, my apologies. Is that document, and that's the DR 350? 530. 530. And we can talk about that document. It's a two page handwritten application completed by. Our street superintendent, Mel Aldrich, at the time, to just put in the initial idea behind a project. The problem is, is when everybody looked at this, the only thing they're looking at is the federal portion of the engineering, and they didn't even add all the items together, let alone the local match, and then total it up. The actual total at the initial time was $101,000 approximately for what is known as the PE phase, which is the preliminary engineering phase. So the request that went to the auditor didn't have that correct, even though the documentation is attached to it. 
And so people, and I'm, and this is not a critique, it's just sometimes lay people that don't work with this directly every day, and then we start spreading it around as gospel, when just by adding together and localizing that preliminary engineering phase, you get a total of $101,000. And that happened throughout the analysis of this document as it was sent to the auditor. And so, I just want to collect okay. the record. Thank you. And so, that's so, the first thing. So, instead of 68, I'll say 101. Um, and the reason I'm asking this question of, of you folks is uh, there's been some talk about the, the project having to have been re-engineered or you know changed a couple times based upon some requirements or uh, because of the state. And so, I just want to know some clarification. Is that in fact true? Was the firm just mistaken in what they thought they were going to encounter there, or? I just want to point out that it's not state. We have to follow federal regulations. Okay. And so a lot of, I just want to clarify, it's not the state telling you that you're doing this. This is federal regulation. Mm -hmm. And so those regulations that we ran through, through the, for this project, we ran run through for every other federal aid project that, that goes, that the local has federal aid money on it. The process was not any different. Sure. Lots of times you get, you start preliminary design and then you get to a point and you try to mitigate for all of this, the, you know, so you have the less amount of impact for a project and sometimes that causes some design, just redesign work. So, you know, I can't speak specifically about every single one of the supplements that maybe went out for construction engineering, but there, it is typical on a project. I mean, you know, when you program a project, the DR530 that Greg is talking about, that is so preliminary. I mean, you you don't have survey done, you don't have a consultant out that has even looked at the project at that time. That is just going, hey, we have a purpose and need, and we're going to put some um, numbers together to help get some funding for a project. That really is what it is. That is so, not gospel. I mean, that is, it is a preliminary, a very, very, I don't even want to call it preliminary. It is just a, we have a project, we're going to, we have some, have some, some ideas of what's going to happen on the project, and until you hire a consultant and you get into the design, that's going to change, and that happens on every single one of our projects. Okay, thank you. We typically see, we call them a, a status 10 estimate to a status 30 estimate, because so a lot of times you'll see about a 30% increase almost mm -hmm. on every project. Right. Right. Just because it's very preliminary, again, lots of time has gone by. I think you know, from an engineering perspective, there's always a certain kind of threshold you have to get above small projects, you know, a few blocks long, and so it's kind of an initial you know, fee to get into the system here, right. and so I think there's some of that you're seeing the engineering percentage is a little higher on this project okay. than you'd see on other projects. One other last little question I had, and I don't know if this is for you or not, but um, there was, uh, just I have a question from accounts, from my concern as a councilman as far as the change orders that, that we're allowing Emmy Collins, of the three change orders. Is there any kind of a cap on those? Can we set a cap, or how does that, any, how would that work? Any change this? orders will come before you guys. So, I mean, you're, we're not going to approve something without you guys knowing what change orders are gonna be on the project. So what are, do we know? The, we don't know the amounts. No. Right? They won't know until they're in. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, we, and we can't even guess, give a we range. Don't, I mean, Every project has the ability for change orders, and I know some people look at it like it's a, a scam, but the reality is is that if you get into the project, you're gonna find things you weren't expecting. Suitable materials. No, I understand yeah. that. Yeah. I, I just wondered if, if, if we as a council have the ability to, to give like a range, like not to exceed X, well, you, you know, you, based upon a recommendation. You have that ability despite not putting the change order. As far as building it into the original contract, we don't we typically don't do, do that because we don't necessarily, sometimes, you know, maybe there's a percentage, but it you probably run into is, you want to hamstring yourself by saying, here's the cap, and then they're going to come in and say, well, we're going to need $6,000 more to do this, but no, you exceeded the cap. I mean, realistically, the council would probably approve that so that the project can keep going. So you have the, you have the check and balance already in place by bringing the change order back to you, um, but there's nothing specific on top of that. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, when then I just want to make sure I'm good on the process here. So the one entity said with the audit, we're referring you to the Federal Highway Administration 
and the state DOT. Mm -hmm. So as I understand it from what I think Linda might have said is then that has, those questions have now been submitted. Do they get submitted to you guys? I haven't seen any questions. They were only forwarded, pursuant to the email we forwarded to you, they were only forwarded to Joseph uh, Joe Warning. Warning. Joe Warning, who is the division administrator in Nebraska for Federal Highway. His, so divi he his division, his division okay. is the one that did all the oversight of this project and signed off on it and signed off on all of the NEPA okay. documents. His division is the one, from my understanding of the project, again, a lot of this still predates me, but his division is the one that came back and said, after our review, you need to move the project over, you need to go acquire the right of way. That will be his entire division of staff that did all that work. So, so it's the same people who have already approved everything? Yes. Okay, I just wanted to understand the process. Well, that's what I'm holding here. This is the NEPA document. It's a category of exclusion, it's a level three, so it's been signed off by uh, Fed Highway, like you're saying. Scott Staff is the review uh, analyst for the environmental side of it. And so he signed off on this document as well as NDOT, as well as the city did in 2018. Uh, and like as you were talking, Greg, with the uh, shifting of the alignment, which ended up having to go on East Heritage Homeowners Association. A lot of that's because of the Wilderness Park future development. I think there was a 2001 city plat um, that showed this future Wilderness Park. It's currently being farmed, but because of that, it creates that as a, what's it, a 4F. It's a park now. And so to mitigate that loss, mitigate that damage, the, project, the roadway had to be shifted as far over to avoid those impacts. And so that, yes, ended up with having to acquire some private right of way, some private ownership property, so. Any other questions? One other yes, question, sir. since you brought up process, um, Linda or somebody mentioned that that they didn't feel like the, the uh, proper process for the eminent domain was followed, and sure. you're kind of that expert. Sure. What's, what's your take on that? So for us, um, we uh, had a highway or statutes really don't define good faith negotiations as far as the timeline goes. Uh, we've kind of interpreted from federal standards that 30 days is enough time to consider an offer. At our office, we try to make three good contacts with somebody that's actually talking to them on the phone. Uh, I spoke with Linda directly with her. I think she was in New York at the time when I spoke with her um, on the subway, I believe. <laughs> so anyways, we've talked to her several times. Um, property was staked, I believe, in January. Reviewed the site, tried to make contact. They weren't interested in negotiations. Uh, come June is when we sent out the 10 day letter. That's just kind of put them on notice, giving you 10 days to realize that this is moving forward with eminent domain action because we've heard no responses. Uh, we went through several months of uh, back and forth trying to get even the information of the tenant. They refused to give up who the, who's farming the ground, even. So there's been there was very little cooperation as far as that goes. Did you eventually, so, though, contact the tenant? So we did eventually what, contact the tenant. And what was the response? Uh, they were listed as part of one of the, the counter, counter moves on that. No, as far as, like, were they, I don't know, they told you that they weren't supposed to talk to you, or was there any conversation about that? Okay. No, there wasn't. Okay. No, the neighbor tells me that we didn't. Does that help, say? Yeah. Okay. So typically, we would try to go to move condemnation in 45 to 60 days. Our offer went out in January. Uh, the condemnation action wasn't filed until was it December? So almost a year. So we feel that's a good faith negotiations. We've tried several times. Uh, the property was staked multiple times. So when did we have the the um, eminent domain meeting? What September. 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 So, so I guess did, well, did you have any contact with them between September and December? Do you recall? Um, I think at that point we all my contacts were with their attorney. Okay. Um, I believe in June, Linda had stopped by uh, in the UT's office. Uh, I think Tom Weber's name was mentioned several times. He's my chief negotiator. Okay. Um, and so she had a conversation with him. Please direct now all contacts to our attorney. That's what we tried to do at that time. Okay. Since you mentioned it, I guess, Linda, yeah. did you make contact with our lawyer other than to call and ask who the tenant farmer was? Uh, several times. I tried to. You tried, but did you contact? Did you talk to yes, our lawyer? Yes, I've talked to Greg several times. Since? I have but emails if you want to see it. Yeah, I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah. You know, for myself, you know. I think the, your point is that 
it's not like you didn't try to reach out to sure. them and that Absolutely. you didn't try to talk to them. And Absolutely. so Absolutely. you can you dispute don't want over to how many people yeah. would love to come to an agreement. Well, yeah, and, and we, have, and we also, way. we feel the same way. We Just rather not out. have to. Yeah. And I think yeah. in a lot of cases, when you've done projects, you're able to negotiate for the needed property and then it's not an issue. But um, do you have any, Sid, are you good? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the council at this time? Very good. Yeah, thank you for coming this evening. So we have a resolution in front of you. If any other questions or comments, I would introduce the resolution for the lower bid to Collins Contracting Company for eight hundred four thousand four hundred twenty-eight dollars and thirty-six cents. We have resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number twenty twenty dash ten. Would anyone like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Same amount. We register your votes. Please play, please, please play the votes. Yeah. Okay. What are you in favor? Wilkin, Miller, Singleton, Schmidt, Hendricks. Opposed? Back. Cancer. Colby. Resolution passed. Um, item number three, this is also a resolution approving professional services agreement for construction engineering with JEO Consulting Group, this is Carol K. Boulevard, Bader Hillcrest, NDOT Project URB-6763-1. Did you want to add anything, Greg? Just note this is part of the, the contract process. We had to have construction engineering part of the approved process with the state on all contracts on this one. So, Any questions for Greg? I'd like to introduce the resolution. I'll introduce it. The resolution has been introduced and is designated as resolution number 2020 11. Would anyone like to move that this resolution be passed and adopted? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Please register your votes. Please sway the votes. Voting in favor, Wilkin, Miller, Stanford, Schmidt, Hendricks, opposed, Back, Cancer, Colby. Okay. Item four, award bid for 6th Street Water Main Improvements Project. Greg. Yes, this is uh, the first of the projects that we teed up uh, in the 10-year uh, water study that was completed this last year as part of your budget. This project will essentially replace uh, water main and properly size it from the intersection of Hillcrest and Highway 15, 6th Street, all the way north to, I want to say North Street. Basically, just right before the high school, uh, before that turns. We'll also, at the time, since we'll be in the right-of-way of the highway, we have a future plan for another project in that 10-year plan to cross all the way from Hillcrest out to the west, or to the east, as part of the Hillcrest redevelopment of that roadway. We're trying to match those up so when the, you go in and redo Hillcrest, we'll redo the water main while we have it all ripped out. Um, to avoid causing issues to the highway again, we're going to put in that crossing now while we're in there developing in the highway right of way and dealing with the state so we don't have to come back and deal with the state specifically on that Hillcrest water main project. And so this project was designed by Jake before he left. He put together the specs and the bid documents, has been reviewed by Tim Rich, the water superintendent, uh, and the new city engineers plan to do the on-site construction engineering and management uh, as they come in. And so Jake did review as part of uh, this process and, and our continuing uh, contracts with him. He did review this bid and is okay with moving forward on it. Questions on item four? Does someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Sorry. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? So you might be registered your votes. Please play the votes. Item 5, award bid for 2020 Asphalt Overlay Improvement Project, right? Uh, asphalt Overlay Project, similar project to uh, what we did last year on North Columbia. Take care of some of our curbing and corners for water development, then obviously the surface of North Columbia. We'll also go in while we have a contractor here as part of our budget process for the cemetery, and we'll go in and continue to do some asphalt overlay within the cemetery as planned in the budget. Jake also designed this one, and just like the water project, and he also approved, uh, recommended approval of this bid pursuant to his review. You kept him busy. 
<laughs> still in. Any question on item number five? None, I entertain a motion. Move to award bid. Second. We want you in a second to register your vote. Please spread the votes. Item 6, this is an ordinance amending the municipal code, municipal code, chapter 290, offenses, articles, article 8, obstructions to add requirements and set penalties for placing stone in the street right of way. Great. Uh, yes. So this year, obviously, again, last year was a really bad year for snow. Uh, I think we hit our record in regards to the number of times that we went out and plowed snow. Uh, this year, again, we had a few issues because of the nature of the quality or, or lack of quality of the snow. As you remember, we had some of these that were very, very heavy, um, and we continue to have issues and complaints coming in to the police department and the building inspection office, codes office, about people throwing all of their snow out into the street, snow blowing it into the street. People are driving by, running into it, and other complaints. And so the PD went out to just go provide notices to people and, and remind them, of, hey, you're not supposed to throw your snow off your driveway and stuff out in the middle of the street. Uh, one, the plows may have already gone by and aren't coming back again. It's not meant to be sitting out there just waiting to be melted. Um, and in following up on that, they realized when they went to go look for it that they could not find the ordinance they seemed to remember. And so Bonnie ultimately did track down the ordinance. <laughs> and it was approved in 1993 by the city with the penalty exactly, basically as you see written here today. But what happened was, as you know, there's a codification process where we pass ordinances and pass ordinances throughout a year or a given period. Then we put them in the, to the book, basically it's the city code book, and then it's adopted in there. What happened was is throughout, we checked every codification we could find in book format after 93, and somehow somebody in 93 or thereafter forgot to stick it in there, and it just never came in. There's no ordinance to repeal it ever, it just never got into a codification, then no one ever noticed it again. Human error. Yep. So that's what we're looking at on the <laughs> ordinance. Are there any questions or comments on that? Would someone like to introduce the ordinance? I'll introduce the ordinance. Okay. All right, Council Thanks. <laughs> 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 Grandma. An ordinance to amend the municipal code of the city of Seward, Chapter 290, Offenses, <laughs> Article 8, Obstructions, <laughs> to add requirements and set penalties for placing snow in the street right of way. To repeal all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict, to provide for an effective date, to provide for publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form. The ordinance has been read by title and is designated as ordinance number 2020 6, and the title is hereby approved. I need a motion to dispense with statutory rule. So moved. Second. The motion and a second. We approve the discussion. Seeing none, to register your votes. Please display the votes. Again, this is ordinance number 2020-6. Would anyone like to move that this ordinance be passed and adopted as read? Second. The motion and a second is for discussion. Seeing none, again, the question is, shall ordinance number 2020-6 be finally passed and adopted? To register your votes, please display the votes. And this is the only ordinance for this evening, so only one final motion to make this ordinance a part of the permanent record. So moved. Second. Motion and a second, to register your votes. Please play the books. I'm seven. Discuss claims presented for mailbox damage following snow removal from streets. Greg. Yes. We don't have a firm policy on how to deal with mailbox damage during snow removal. So when we're out plowing, um, we get different reasonings for why mailboxes go down. Uh, it can be anywhere from our mistake where the plow actually hits it but the expectation is is if you, I think if you go by the actual guidelines of the mail the federal mail your mailbox should not go over the curb line so as long as my guys somehow aren't <coughs> jumping that blade up onto the curb if they're following that with the way that those are designed and they're following the curb they shouldn't hit a mailbox another thing that we tend to find happens is that you know somebody stuck in a mailbox 15 years ago they didn't use treated wood it's rotted it finally got some snow pushing on it and it just fell over and broke off, whether that was at the ground level or above. Um, and then the last one is also just the sheer weight of the snow. That's what this I year was the big one for that. Um, if you went out and scooped any of it on that one specific snow, it was the most incredibly wet snow and provided a lot of weight. If you're plowing in that, you can feel it just driving, it's pushing against you, and that weight will just 
push mailboxes over. And so we have not had a developed specific policy of how we address these. And I think we would like some guidance from the council to kind of do a uniform way. We prefer not to send these all to insurance. That's gonna be a big waste of time and effort and you'll have to process every single claim through and forward it on. What's the, like a typical, I need my mailbox replaced is 75 bucks? I don't know. I would I'm, probably. A couple hundred probably. No. The time you do your digging, if you put your post and you dig it in and everything, if you do a wood structure, plus you have to get the mailbox, depending on what size, you could, I'd like to say up to 200 probably max. Depending if you concrete your post in and I just haven't done one for a while. Uh, <laughs> and the ground is Personally, like I guess that's a little high. The, yeah. the other thing is, I will tell you, the state and many of the counties, their position is the right-of-way is there for a reason. It's meant to be a place where we push snow, where we move things off. And so the state has always said and had the claim, and they reference it in an article we saw in the Journal Star, we just couldn't track down the statute, that they basically say, that's what the right-of-way is for, and we're not paying anything. We will so not approve a mailbox claim no matter what. So even the if state we hit and the it. county don't, or the state and the county don't typically? Typically, no. They do not. The state explicitly doesn't. It was noted in that article. Usually, the city of Lincoln doesn't. I think they had a situation where somebody just went wrong down normal and got all of them somehow. Um, and so, again, we're just looking for something uniform. I did check with the city administrators across the state. And it goes, it runs the gamut. Some have a very definitive, like, hey, we just do 30 bucks. If you have a claim and you can prove it up, show us a picture, turn in a receipt that you actually fixed it, we give you 30 bucks. That's our process. Otherwise, if you want to file the full claim and send it on to insurance, we'll gladly do so, but it's going to get denied because the state statute says not the municipality or the state or the county's fault because that is our property. That's our right of way. The other concern I have, and I, and if we want to go with zero, perfectly fine with that. If we want to give a number, is make sure also we have the situations right now where people are putting like stone, brick, or Nate post office box, which are very beautiful. We love to see those, but it's unfortunate for us to have to pay a thousand dollars because somebody is putting something out there that we all know we're going to be pushing snow into and other elements as we continue to do our required obligations to clear the roadway. Plus, a lot of people. When they measure for their uh, mailbox, they're right to the edge of the curb. There's no recess back for figuring for snow plows and that. Right. So it, the mailbox is going to lose. Well, the, there is the, the regulations now. They're not Most people aren't putting mailboxes in new developments. not allowed. Yeah. Um, so we are moving away from it. I guess I would be comfortable with saying, like, here's our designated amount. You can prove what, like what you said. Bring in your receipt that you repaired it. You have the photos. You know, fifty dollars or something like that. I don't know. That's just a, I'm just throwing that out. The other one that happens because they just come out in the morning and they see their mailbox down, and we saw some photos where we, we questioned what happened because there are like tire marks, treads, like going up to the mailbox, and we're going. That wasn't us. Some kid could have swung around a corner a little too fast because the conditions slid up and hit your mailbox, backed away, and drove off. And right. you came out and went, "Oh, they plowed my snow." Hey. And we're not going to know that. And so, well, I mean, we're not going to do a deep I mean, investigation. What, are, we waste what, are, what are the other cities that are ready to do? I mean, did you throw this out on your little, yeah. little, your little board? Yeah, a lot of them don't do it at all. They don't approve claims. They just say, no, it's it's just like the state does. It's part that's of, the requirement part of for the right way. That's the expectation. <laughs> you know, if you want to have an expensive one up there, you can do it on the relative cheap. I see a lot. We threw around years ago, $35. Apparently was something that had been mentioned in City Hall. Um, $50 would potentially be appropriate. Again, we also don't, but you're opening the door for all of the... Whatever, if you set an amount, every claim is going to be at least that amount. What's your recommendation, Greg? My recommendation? Yeah. We've done it in the past and we continue to be good stewards of the city. And so I think a, uh, a nominal amount to help offset the cost of $35, $50, I think that's appropriate. Um, but we'll do. We'll try to do our due diligence again. I don't like having the police department wasting time <laughs> going staring at mailboxes for hours upon. And that's what they did. They had to file investigation files and everything else. As long as we have photos, we kind of can check with the guys. We know their routes. We know where they're going. They they sometimes say, "Hey, 
I saw a big old whip of snow just push one over like a feather. It could be because it's rotted. You know, I wouldn't make it automatic. I think there should be some discretion. Otherwise, anytime somebody wants to replace their mailbox, or <laughs> wait until it snows and kick it over. <laughs> it's true. I mean, that, that's a risk you're taking. I, I don't think that most I think people I, are like that. I bad. guess that no. some kind of nominal amount at the discretion of the administrative process. Yeah. How many a year do we get? Oh, normally just a handful, just a few. This year, I mean, it was like... We're not getting tens of twenties, thirties. How many do we have sitting there now, Bonnie? I think we probably have... So it's, it's not a lot, but a lot of times it's just the nature of the snow. I mean, if, if it's something where it's turned into ice and the, the, our crew is going down in a pretty fast cliff and they're just scraping ice off, you know, you're going to have more, more instances than you do if it's just a regular snow where it's, it's not real wet or real heavy. So Greg, can you you put together a policy then and bring it back? Is that uh, what you're talking about? If it's a policy, we just keep it internal. We just okay. have guidance tonight. If you say, okay. hey, I'd move that we leave it to the discretion of administration and cap anything at, and throw a dollar amount out, that's all. Okay, we'll I'll make a motion that we move forward with something capping it at $50 and uh, leave the rest of it to the administration to sort out the details. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Saying none, the rest of your votes. Please take the votes. The administrator's brief report. I'll, I'll answer any questions you have. Um, again, just been uh, knee deep in, in kind of finishing up this Carol K project, uh, finishing up our FEMA projects in relation to the floods last year. Hoping we don't have more this year, seriously. Um, and then uh, continuing to work on getting these projects set for this summer. It's going to be a very busy construction year for us. Uh, and then we're also interviewing and finishing up interviews with city engineer candidates. There you go. Is there questions? If not, is there a motion to accept the report? Move. Second. Motion and second. Please register your votes. Please pay the votes. Did you request for council agenda item to mention of action? I don't know if it's an agenda item. I just want to make a, I guess, a request to look at Hillcrest as part of the one and six year plan in the future. I assume we can do that as part of that process. The only thing I'll note is I believe it's in the one and six. Fantastic. But just for clarification purposes, it's in the one and six. It's segmented. The first segment is and the reason being is because, as we've stated before, the preference by NDOT and engineers in this project was do not work on the roadway adjacent to the federal project because at the same it will be time. In the way. Yeah. They don't like mixing those things. Okay. So they said avoid that. And so as long as I've been here, every year that you've programmed in, and I think even before my arrival, you've programmed in the Carroll K project, you've programmed in the improvements adjacent there too for Hillcrest. And so next summer, pursuant to your current CIP and one in six, we'll go through and improve, I believe, from approximately the trail or Carroll K all the way up basically to Eastridge. We'll improve the roadway, storm sewer, and then probably a sidewalk connection to the trail on one side or the other of the right of way there. Then from there, we'll continue in the segments of maybe one big one, probably not, it's a pretty in-depth process, but we'll do the segment from there to, I believe, North Columbia, 